Works, great. Hi everybody, great to see everyone here in Amsterdam. Second time back, great fan of the city. Please invite me again, I'll, I'll fly straight here. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about 20 ways that event-driven architectures can help improve your development process. I'll admit to you I put this title together before I thought about what the 20 things are, and then I found out I've got 20 minutes. So we're gonna really speed through these. So my name is James Bezik. I'm a developer advocate in the AWS serverless team. Before this, I was a software developer for many years and also a product manager for a long time as well. The most important thing on this slide is my email address and my Twitter handle. So if you have any questions at all in the future when you're building serverless apps, just let me know and I'll do my very best to help. So some of the things I'm talking about today come from this application that my team built called Serverless Espresso. And you'll see this at reInvent and summits and other events that we're doing currently. This was kind of a harebrained idea we had about building a production application that serves thousands of cups of coffee at lots of different locations. And this is an EDA-based app. So based upon this and all the things we've heard from customers, that's where we're extrapolating these 20 things that we're going to talk about in now 18 minutes. Also, the key service we're using here is EventBridge. So if you've not used this so far, this is a serverless event bus. You have a default event bus in every one of your AWS accounts already. And lots of AWS events are being produced there all the time by services you're using. So if you're not currently using EventBridge, I recommend checking it out. So let's get started with the first of the 20. So the first thing we found is that event-based architectures can really help decouple your workload. So we built these microservice-based applications. And as you know, these applications tend to get very sticky very quickly. And what we found was splitting amongst our team different microservices and acting like we're a true software shop, different people could build different parts of the application without us really knowing the implementation details. And some of the services can actually be very, very simple, just emitting events, saying what they've done, allowing other people to interact. So if you're in a software application where you find things are getting very, very tightly coupled, this can provide a very elegant, simple way of starting to bring things apart again and making it more manageable, especially when you've got lots and lots of different services. It can also be a good way of replacing private APIs. So who here has implemented a private API with API Gateway? Who here enjoyed doing that? OK, not so many. So of course, one of the things with private APIs is they have to be private, but it can be a bit of a trial to make that work. Well, in many cases, you actually don't need to do that, especially if you're building asynchronous applications. You, you can replace that uh, type of interface using events. Now, even with some synchronous applications, you can make that work. But it's significantly easier just having these services consume an event instead of having to listen through a private API. One of the great things about EventBridge, more so than just EDA in general, is that it actually integrates with a range of different SaaS providers as well. So many of our customers today are using software as a service providers, Datadog, Salesforce, PagerDuty, and many, many others. And typically, as a developer, when you're working with data from these types of systems, you're going to be using webhooks. And webhooks can be a little bit tricky to manage, because if you get lots of data from these providers, and your system on your side has an outage, or you're not quite ready for that amount of data, it can be difficult to get the data replayed. Often you have to go and fetch this information. It's a bit more tricky and involved than it looks. EventBridge actually makes it very simple to integrate with these providers. You simply enable it on the bus, and you enable it in the configuration of the SaaS provider, and the events will start appearing in this partner event bus. And so it can dramatically, integrate, it can dramatically simplify the integration you have with that kind of provider if you're using that kind of setup. It can also replace what I call API chains. And so what is that? Well, you saw a similar diagram in Dave's presentation, but often when you build API-based applications, you start with one service, it has an API. You start with a second service, you put them together, that has an API. So far, we're decoupled, everything's great. And as you go on, you start adding more and more services. And so we frequently use this example, but it's really a proxy for many of these types of applications where in the happy path, the order service calls the invoice service, the payment service that goes to fulfillment and shipping. Nothing wrong here. This is great. Let's keep building applications this way. Until this happens, you get exceptions. 
And so if you imagine something going wrong, like the fulfillment doesn't work because the item that somebody ordered isn't on a shelf somewhere, that service then has to call the invoice service to make a correction, or maybe also call the payment service to make an adjustment, and then call other services, and each one starts calling each other. And this is kind of a nightmare to configure, but also what you've built is a monolith. And so what started as a nicely decoupled set of services very quickly becomes very tightly drawn together. And replacing these types of integrations with events can actually go a long way to stopping this happening. Next, and this is a, an issue that's really near and dear to my heart. So as a developer of 20 <coughs> something years, I found that extensibility is the most important thing when I'm building software. So why is this? Well, you get all your requirements up front, and you go and build what you've been told to build, and when th within three months you find that you've not built what users need anymore, and you have to change what you're building. And this happens over and over and over, and I think we've all come to learn that we all start to essentially build continuous projects that implement features for people. But how do you build things that way when your initial design may be wrong? How do you make all the right technical assumptions up front without having all of the requirements in place. And this is something I've personally struggled with for a long time when I was writing software, thinking I basically either didn't know what I was doing or I wasn't a good enough architect. But really the fact is, nobody can do this. You can't take on requirements you don't know about and get architecture right. And so with this type of implementation, with using an EDA approach, you don't actually need to worry about that as much because you're building services and you're building features and emitting events and not worrying too much, much about what the future looks like because you can attach future functionality onto those events from earlier parts of the application. And so we found this really does help make your applications that much more extensible. And so the phrase I remember somebody saying, you know, sing like nobody's listening, dance like nobody's watching. Um, I say push out events all the time like no one's consuming them because chances are you might well be consuming them within a month or two for requirements that you don't yet know about. Another great thing is it can help you build simpler webhooks that actually scale. Now I talked a little bit about webhooks in the SAS example, but this is a bit different. So who's here has built a webhook? It's fun, right? So now with webhooks, web you have a slightly different problem when you're building them versus consuming them. And so if you build a webhook, one of the problems is dealing with sudden volume. You might be suddenly hit with lots and lots of requests, and so you have to factor that into the way you, you can design and scale that webhook. The other problem is if you have a, problem, a, a bug or any sort of code issue or outage on your side, how do you make sure that you're actually responding to everybody and making, making sure every request is handled? And so building webhooks that are very resilient is not trivial. It's actually a big problem when you start taking it apart. Well, using EventBridge, this is actually much simpler. And so I've put a URL that you can take a look at the code here. But you can use an HTTP API endpoint or a REST API endpoint. You can then push this directly to EventBridge using VTL. And then you could use potentially SQS to route that where that will durably store the event um, so it can sit there waiting for your downstream system to consume that. And you could use Lambda or Fargate or really anything you prefer. But just by putting those three services together, with no custom code, you've now built a very resilient, very scalable webhook. So AWS SAM templates. Well, SAM templates are great. If you use SAM, that's great. If you don't, it's something like Terraform, CDK, any of these types of IAC tools that we're all becoming used to as we build applications. And one of the problems I find with these is that as your applications get larger and larger, and the templates get larger, implementing changes gets trickier. As you start to deploy things, it becomes more fragile, you get more resources, you end up with thousands of lines of YAML and so forth. And so I was looking for ways of breaking these down into, things, into, into pass, parcels that are more manageable. And I found that event-based event architectures can help me do this. And so a couple of years ago, I wrote this application. I put the, the URL on the screen if you want to check out the app. And this is an app that's designed for enterprises where you put all of your, your enterprise files into an S3 bucket and it looks to see if they're PDFs, docs, JPEGs, or whatever else, and then understands what's in those and indexes them. And this looks like a really impressive kind of Rube Goldberg machine I've built here. 
but it's actually very hard to maintain. If I want to add new file types or new different ways of handling data, I'm directly injecting new resources into all of the steps that are going on here. And so that's not really ideal. And so I came up with an alternative way of building this using an event bus. And instead, I could break up the different Lambda functions into different classes of function, all of, all of which just consume from the bus, make some sort of enrichment to the data and put it back on the bus, and break it apart into a series of different sections. And in this were five different SAM templates. And so the effect was that anybody could then make changes to one of the five areas without having to affect any of the code already in there, and really fundamentally change the application without breaking it apart in a fragile way. So, I found using an event-based approach can really help you when you've got very complex IAC-based applications. Similarly, it can also help when you're working with S3 buckets. So if you've worked with S3 to Lambda, you probably know that you cannot have overlapping prefixes and suffixes when you're working with S3 buckets. And it's one of those problems you run into fairly easily, that if you're using any sort of filter, you can use it once and not again. And that often doesn't really represent how we want to interact with buckets. In enterprises, we've got thousands of buckets. Often we have to work with multiple applications reading from a single bucket or vice versa. So the event bridge, this again is a bit simpler. We can do this in SAM and also with CDK and other frameworks too. And so here we can simply define the bucket. The key thing here is to make sure we turn on the event bridge enabled configuration to true. And then the consuming Lambda function, all that has to do is specify an event bridge rule to then consume those events. And effectively, you've now decoupled the bucket from your Lambda function using an event bus. And this gives you significantly more flexibility. It makes it possible to build multiple workloads than listen to these overlapping subscriptions. Part two of this same idea when I was working through this is often we have workloads that want to work with multiple buckets. And if you have S3 to Lambda currently, that's not particularly easy because one Lambda function can only listen to one S3 bucket. So if you have something like this where you have a sales team and they have one bucket per sales month, my sales January, my sales February, and so forth, and you've got some sort of workload, this can help you because you can have those three buckets push events into EventBridge, and then your one Lambda function or your workload, all it has to do is listen to those buckets using one rule. And so in this case, you'll see the rule has a bucket name expressing those different, uh, or it has a rule expressing those different bucket names. And that means you can now listen to all of the events in that bucket without having to replicate your application three different times. I'm going to take it one step further. And this is great because it helped me get towards those 20 items. So I'm just going to take an extra step on this. And this allows you to also make your application work for buckets that don't exist yet. And this is kind of interesting, because how do you bind a Lambda function to an S3 bucket that nobody's published yet? And as you might know if you used services like SAM, it can be a bit tricky trying to introduce S3 buckets later after the fact. Well, we take my previous example, and now we've got a My Sales April, and there'll be a My Sales May, and so forth. And all we've done is change the bucket name prefix using this um, filter saying prefix equals My Sales dash. And so in the future, as other people start to add new buckets that meet that naming criteria, my application will continue to work without me needing to do anything. It can also be useful to use custom buses to create security boundaries around the events going through your application. And this is something I picked up through a, a tweet from Ben Kehoe. Does everybody follow Ben Kehoe? I hope so. So I actually learned a lot from Ben Kehoe, but ben, ben mentioned this, and I thought this is really interesting because we get asked all the time, when should you use default buses, when should you use custom buses? And there are lots of reasons to do it back and forth. You can sort of say, well, default bus is usually better because that means anyone can listen to your events. And remember, you don't know who is listening yet, so there's a good argument with this. Custom buses can feel cleaner because that's your bus and no one's going to tamper with that, so maybe you want to do that. But actually, a better argument for the decision is this security boundary. If you have data in your organization and you want to strictly control who can listen to those events, this turns out to be a very clean way of making sure that you're, whoever publishes events into this bus, you have much more control over who can then consume those events. 
This one I really loved because we discovered it by accident. So we had our serverless Espresso application running. It's got something like 18 or 20 Lambda functions. As you know, when Lambda functions run, they produce lots and lots of log files. And we were in production with thousands of drinks and we ended up with, bless you, an enormous number of different log files that we had to go through. And we thought, wouldn't it be great to just be able to tail a log file, like the good old days of servers. We were getting wistful for the server days. And I was thinking, well, it'd be great just to throw up a Linux terminal, tail somewhere, and see what one microservice was doing. Well, we figured out how we can do this, because we created a setup where we allowed each, each um, microservice to have a bus. And then all we did is create a catch-all event, where every event going through the bus would then be sent to CloudWatch logs, and then we could lo tail that log file. And it became a super, super, super simple way to see everything that was going through that one microservice. And so we used this extensively in development just to make sure we knew what was actually happening within our design. You can also use events to synchronize your applications in ways that might not be immediately obvious as well. So in the case of Serverless Espresso, we've got three front ends. They're all real-time front ends. There's a web front end that runs in, on your phone for the users that come to the booth. There's one on these TVs. There's one used by baristas on tablets. We've got step functions workflows running that keep track of all the individual orders. There's really things going on all over the place in the application. And without thinking of events, this would be kind of hard to coordinate. You end up building some sort of very large central system that's trying to keep everything else in step. So when I looked at the architecture of Serverless Espresso, and you can download and play with this at the URL I've put on the screen, we've got these different microservices that are doing these different things. And you'll see the step functions workflow that's really keeping track of everything. And on the left, you've got these different uh, web apps are tr also real time trying to keep up to, up to date. And to keep them in sync, all we did was use the event bus. So when a cup of coffee is ready, the completed event gets put on the bus. That knows to route that, in this case, to a publisher service. That then uses IoT Core to publish that to the front ends to different topics, depending on who's listening. And really, within about 20 lines of code in that publisher service, we built a system where we could keep this whole thing in sync. And it's incredibly simple from a design point of view, but when you're standing on a booth watching 500 people ordering coffee and everyone's getting the messages in their pockets, you realize the sheer power of this type of architecture. So last year, you may know that EventBridge uh, extended some capabilities to make it easier to pass events between accounts and between different regions. And that helps people build more available and more resilient apps. But more recently, we've added global endpoints to this service too. And so this gives you some really simple but powerful tools to enable regional failover. So many people don't build this into their apps. It might not be appropriate for your workload, but it's worth thinking about depending on what you're building. And in this case, what it allows you to do is use Route 53 to route traffic to another region in the event that latency delivery of an event starts to grow. And so the key thing here is there's a new metric that's being published by the service that measures the amount of time from an event coming into EventBridge to being delivered to your target. And as that time starts to grow, if it gets to be too long, it throws an alarm in CloudWatch, and that triggers a change to another region. And so it can really simplify a way of pouring events over to another region. It's not perfect for every possible workload, but it's definitely something to consider if you're thinking about adding a backup region to handle in the event of some sort of service disruption. OK, we're getting there, 15. I promised you 20. We're getting there. Five more to go. So who wants to use production data when you're implementing dev and test workloads? It'd be great, wouldn't it? But you know how hard it is? You've got to get the data from various things. So most of us don't do this, because it's really just a bit tricky to work out on the problem. Well, the good news is you can do this fairly easy with EventBridge using archive and replay. And all you have to do is configure this on your bus. So you set this up so that you turn on the archive, play that in production, every event going through just gets put into an archive. And then when you want to replay those events, you can do it at will. And so it's actually a really effective way to play production data directly into your dev and test environment. Super, super simple to use. Um, actually helped us find a lot of bugs in our code. And yes, we did have bugs in our code, mostly my code. 
Number 16, you can use EventBridge to scale up Lambda really, really quickly. So as you might know, if you use services like SQS to Lambda, that's actually going to be limited by the number of polars, and so it doesn't necessarily scale up if really, really busy queues. But if you need something to go from zero to a thousand invocations incredibly fast, EventBridge can do this for you. Again, I've got an application you can try here. It's my GIF creator. It takes two-hour movies, splits them up into GIFs, and it does this by scaling up with Lambda. Doing this in a single EC2 instance or on my laptop takes 20 minutes. Doing it using this application takes 10 seconds. And it does that by scaling up three or 400 different Lambda functions all at once. And you'll see from the CloudWatch stats that um, it, it's, in this case, there's 344 concurrent executions out of nowhere. So anytime you need to parallelize workloads really, really quickly, this can be a great way to do it. You also, keeping track of events can be kind of difficult because we're all producing different events. What's an easy way to do this? Turn on schema, re schema registry. This is something that's available in the service. You just need to enable it. and It starts to track and keep, uh, keep track of all your different events. You can go back through those and inspect them. and It makes it easier to see what you're doing. If you don't want to use schema registry, there's a really good open source tool by somebody I know over here. Called, and the service is called Atlas. And so this is an open source tool that's fantastic. And we used this before we knew Dave, actually. And when you're building applications like this, often you don't know where events are coming from. It's hard to get a visual on what is producing events, where they're being consumed, and what's going on downstream. And so using Atlas, this can very easily produce a visual diagram of what's going on in the app. Super useful in test. I recommend taking a look. You can use rules to reduce Lambda invocations and therefore costs. So in rules, you can specify filters. And filters are really useful because if you're only interested in a subset of events coming through, then you don't need Lambda functions that sit there whose only job in life is to look at a payload and see if something's valid to continue or exit. And nothing's cheaper than no Lambda function running. And so this is something that's very powerful to use to dramatically reduce the number of Lambda, inv Lambda invocations that you're making in your workload. And I see, when, I, when I look at customers and the way they've built, thin, built things, often they're not using this very effectively. So using those filters in those rules can make a big difference. Similarly, you can also use input transformations to the same effect. And so this is kind of hidden in the console. And so I know a lot of people don't see this. But often, if you're using a Lambda function just to modify a payload ever so slightly, to pass it on to the next target, you might not need to do this. You can use this. You can, you can use an input transformer to do this work for you and get rid of another Lambda function. And that's how I got to 20 of these. So Dave mentioned this before, but I'll just mention once more because this is a, a website that we maintain as a team. We use, we use serverless land to keep track of blogs, videos, um, all sorts of other information, learning paths we try to pull together for serverless developers. One of the most useful parts on here is patterns. So if you're looking to attach EventBridge to Lambda or SQS to Lambda or pretty much any two service combination you want to use, and whether you're using CDK or SAM or Terraform or anything else, typically we've got a pattern for you. So it's a good place to start and accelerate your development. Also, if there's something you'd like to see on this website, contact our team and we'll do our very, very best to improve the functionality there. So my name's James Bezik. That's 20 items in 20 minutes. Thank you very much.